Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, can you believe it? It's another semester. First day of the semester, probably the first class for many of you. Do you feel the thrill? Or are you already jaded, cynical after two years? It's going to be worse. It could be another day at work. Same people, same boring routines and tasks. Here, you have a full day of different ideas, different topics, different people around you. Okay, so enjoy it. My name is Andrea Fredi. This is CCS 381, Topics in Cinema Studies. Today, I'm going to tell you a few things about cinema. Then, we're going to talk about who we are and the movies we like. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the class, the website, the syllabus today. I'm going to do that on Wednesday. Meanwhile, if you look at your inbox, you should have a message from me with the link of the class. We're not on Blackboard, we're not on Brightspace. They're ugly. Those platforms are ugly. So I'm using Notion, but you don't need any software. You just need a browser. You just need a phone to see the website. And the easiest way to remember how to get to the class website is by memorizing my name, andreafedi.com, and CCS 381. The class is not here. It's not stored on my personal domain. There, you just find a redirect that will take you to the class. Between now and Wednesday, please familiarize yourself with the class website. Read the syllabus, which, of course, contains two important sections. One is the description, of, the description of the topic. So you can understand a little bit about the topic and the focus of the class in just two or three paragraphs. And the other is the grade components with a few notes about the kind of assignments, exams that are part of this class. As I said, on Wednesday, I'll put it on the screen. I'll go through some of the sections of the website answer any questions, and talk more in detail about the focus of the class and how it impacts or how it transfers into the assignments that we're going to be working on from next week. Okay? So, let me tell you what cinema is. And my strong belief I've been at Stony Brook for almost 30 years, is that a topic, a class is not worth teaching unless it is relevant now, right? Unless it is connected in one way or the other to our lives. So let me tell you an episode, what happened to me yesterday afternoon. I went to Sag Arbor to see a film, EO. EO is Poland's entry to the category of international feature films for the 2020 through 2023 uh, Oscars, right? And it made the shortlist. The shortlist is initially 15 films from different countries, and then later those films are reduced to five for the choice. And I went to Sagarbor because the movie was released in November so that they could participate in the 2023 Oscar. A lot of producers do that. It was a limited release, very few theaters, short time. And now the film is out. Of course, it's not a big budget movie. It's not a box office hit, unless it wins the Oscar, and then it will be re-released, and you could see it at Stony Brook. But right now, you can see it in Sag Arbor on Long Island, or you have to go to the city to a few select theaters. Right? So I go there, small room, about 50 seats, and I sit in the row in front of two ladies, a bit older than I am. I, I don't block their view. I, I sit in, in a seat before them, and, and of course I can hear them talk before the film. And one of them says, you know this is a sad movie, and I didn't bring my tissues. So we watched the movie, beautiful movie, very cinematic. 
I'll talk to you about the film today and Wednesday and you can see a couple of references if you go to the news section of the uh, class website where I listed five or six films that are road movies, representatives of the road movie genre that you might have seen in the last year, during the last year. And the film ends, right? So the question would be, did they cry when they moved? I don't know if they cried. Could have been silent cries. What I know is that I stayed for the credits a little bit because I want to make sure that the credits are not followed by an epilogue or by shots of camera or shots that were deleted out of the final cut of the film. And after the credits have been on for a while, I'm sure that there is no such thing for this film. So I get up to leave. They're still there. They're still there. I'm sure they were moved, right? Of course, I could also mention a disclaimer, right? This could be the experience of a film for people my age, or, or the so-called boomers, right? And your experience might be different, because a lot of younger people don't go to theaters anymore. They watch a film on a device of some sort. Worse yet, you might be one of those creatures who goes to a theater and cannot stay away from the phone and has to turn on the phone during the film and watch it. Which is why a lot of big budget films are just a series of one minute clips, self-contained, incredibly stimulating, but designed in such a way that if you miss a spot here and there, it doesn't mean anything. Which would be the opposite of the experience for an Oscar uh, nominated film like Eel, which is all about the flow of, of the atmosphere, of, of the, the emotions of, of the film. It's not just the story. You're not missing key details in the story. If you miss a moment, you're breaking the flow of the emotions, which is even worse, right? Okay. So other than this personal episode. How do you understand cinema since this is a class? Okay? At a university. So we are here to understand. In order to understand cinema in the easiest, quickest way, let's go back to the origins of cinema. When it was not called cinema, right? The technology of cinema developed in the last quarter of the 19th century, and it was called the moving image, right? In fact, you go to Queens, Long Island City, between Long Island City and Astoria, and you find the museum of the moving image. It's not the museum of cinema. It was also called the moving pictures. So movement is intrinsic to the technology of cinema itself. And this technology developed in a, in a series of places in societies where mobility was being transformed by technology also, right? The train, the bicycle, the automobile, then the plane, all in the space of about 40 years. So there is a connection between cinema and movement, which makes the genre of the road movie an essential cinematic genre. Because cinema was interested in movement in an exterior fashion initially, right? When people are asked to think of the first video, the first film, Usually most people think about a particular short film, which in fact was not the first one. Uh, it, it came in January of 1896, whereas the Lumiere brothers from Lyon, France, uh, first show a series of 10 
films that have not survived in December, and that film was not included. But can you tell me, any, can anyone tell me what is one of the first films that is very iconic, that most people know about or have seen, and what it is about? The first film, yes. Eighteen seventy-eight is not a real film. It is not considered. There is no consensus or agreement that the, the that few seconds of a horse trotting can be seen as a film. Can be considered a film because, in fact, during that period, the eighteen fifties, sixties, and seventies, a lot of photographers were were experimenting with moving images, which were the photographic adaptation of tricks that existed in society. By trick, I mean a series of cards that you can flip, for example. I don't know if you've had that as a kid, uh, and, and see an image move. Or have you seen the film The Wonder, which is on Amazon or Netflix right now from a few months ago? It's a very moving, a beautiful film. And in this film that takes place in Ireland in the 19th century, mid 19th century, like 10 years after the famine, um, someone, a nurse, or, or a nun, well, someone gives the protagonist, who's a young, uh, uh, a child of, of 11 or 12, a simple toy, it is a trick. Two pieces of cord and an image at the center, round on paper, on one side of the image, there is a cage. On the other side, there is a bird. And if you move it with the cords, you can see the bird in and out of the cage, which, of course, represents also the condition of the protagonist who's caged by her family, by the values of society, and forced into a role that could lead to her death by starvation. So 1878, the moving image, the, 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 the the trotting horse could be the first video, but it is not. Other suggestions, as I said, things that people think about. Yes? Isn't there this one, I don't know if it's a linear, but it's one where it's a bunch of factory workers living in a factory? We have a few of those initially, but there is another one that is more famous. You, you are too intellectual to, to be aligned with the populace, to be aligned with the average viewer, evidently. I've underestimated you. You know everything already, so I'm starting from popular knowledge, but you are several levels above that. Yes? I don't know what it's called, but like, it's like the skin and like a ship that went by. Not a ship. What I'm thinking about is another kind of means of transportation. The bicycle? Nope. It is a train, and it became famous because it's associated with a myth, which scholar, scholarship from the last 20 or 25 years have uncovered. But so uh, this shot, uh, it's a minute film. You can find it everywhere, including Wikipedia, uh, YouTube, etc. Uh, it's a train arriving at a station near Marseille, France, and the myth about it is that people who went to the theater to see film, not being familiar with this technology, saw the train coming to them and got scared and ran away from their seats because they thought that the train was real and was going to hit them, okay? So this initially was explained because one of the tricks that existed before photography was the camera obscura. You know the greatest artists of the Renaissance, Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo, most of them use the camera obscura, which is a simple way to transfer what you see around you onto a surface, right? Basically, it's a pinhole. You, you can build it with a box with just a small uh, hole in it, and it, it goes uh, into the sides of the box, the image from the outside is there. Uh, and, and you can have one in real life. Have you ever been to the Camera Obscura in, in Greenport? You know, 
the, if you're not from Long Island or the North Fork, towards the end of the North Fork, there is a village called Greenport. And near the port, near the marina, they have this concrete building, which is in fact is a giant camera obscura. You go there, and in the dark, you see what is outside the walls. And again, there is no camera. It's just a camera obscura. That is to say, it's only mechanical, this transfer of the image. So some people said, well, the people ran away, some scholars said, because they thought this was not a, a, an image that was on the film, but an image from the outside, so they thought. Uh, the train was, was coming to them. It, it cannot be. It, it's clear that's not the case. It cannot be the case also because the, the train is, is coming from an angle. It's a three-quarter shot, like every good shot, right? Other than selfies, you don't take a good shot flat, right? It's a three-quarter always. So train, ships, horses were often depicted in films during the first 10 or 15 years. But it was mostly trick movies. That is to say, the novelty of seeing something new technologically being depicted on this new technology. Besides being connected to movement and mobility, what else was going on around the time cinema was invented? And then perfected, of course, it took until the late 1920s for the technology itself to be perfected. The art of cinema, the style are different things for that. You could say it took until the 1960s, which is the golden era of cinema, 1960s and 70s. But what else was going on in society from the cultural, the cultural standpoint? What kind of revolution was happening? Well, a lot of things were happening, of course. But one thing that it's relevant to us for this brief inquiry into the origins and the roots of cinema is the birth of psychology and psychiatry, right? This is around the same time, 1890s, when Freud, for example, begins to form his theories about the unconscious and, and, and he and other founders of psychiatry developed this. At the same time, this, keep in mind, is not limited to the medical field because psychology develops during this period and is popularized into a genre of books that is represented today in books and also, of course, today in YouTube videos a lot, which is self-help, right? We know, we understand the mind, we understand emotions, and now read this book and make yourself new, make yourself different. And this again, not from the very beginning, but little by little became intrinsic to cinema. It became, first, it, it enters cinema from another dimension, the political dimension, right? Because another thing that was being that was happening in culture and society from the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th, the 1910s, 20s, and early 30s was political influence, mass influence. And cinema became part of that movement, right? Right away, it was uh, recognized that you could really not only move people, influence their minds through films. And a lot of the great films of the 1920s and 30s are propaganda films. And if you instead move up to the 1960s, what I define as the golden era of cinema, that's the realization that cinema must be cinema. That is to say, cinema must break from all other things and be different, be specific, be unique. And the French New Wave, which was imitated by American cinematographers, 
and is still a model for a lot of directors today, the French wave, the French new wave, was all about using the camera to tell the story. How do you visualize a story? Because if you're using dialogue, then you're doing theater and you're putting it on the screen with the help of a camera. And God help us from movies that need to be explained, where someone at the end has to sit down with you in front of you for five, 10 minutes to explain what went on. Hate those movies. I also hate for the same reason those movies where you have a long premise where they have to show the background of every characters, take bullet train or take the glass onion. I want to wonder why a character on the screen is behaving in a certain way. And that's how the character enters my mind, through the gaps, through the visuals, right? And this is how film cinema is explained by Francis Scott Fitzgerald in The Last Tycoon, his last unfinished novel from, when was it, late 1930s or early 1940s. That is to say, in, in this novel you have a producer who explains, who describes a scene and the elements in the scene the little item, the little object, the action of the character on the scene, and then stops. And the other person says, what is happening? Why have I seen this? What is the character doing? That is how you get really into a film and into the magic of films. Personally, my favorite example would be from an American French New Wave example, Le Mans, 1971, a movie made by Steve McQueen and largely created by him. The, director, the director's name doesn't reflect the, the work that was done on the set. At the beginning of this film, you just see a man driving a 911 Porsche from the 1970s through the French countryside, getting into a small French town it's early morning, not many people are around. You see a few people, you see a kiosk selling flowers. You see a beautiful blonde woman with blue eyes buying red roses. And you know from what you see, you don't hear any lines between the woman and the vendor, but you know from the face of the woman that those flowers have been significant. And the man goes through this piazza, the same piazza. Have they intersected? Have they seen each other? Are they connected? The man drives out of town along a stretch of road. He stops. No one is there. And there is a guardrail at the side of the road, a little bit of grass, and then a guardrail. And you can see that there is old guardrail, big rusty, no guardrail in front of you, and then old guardrail. So a segment of the guardrail has been replaced. The man is, has his arm on, on the door of the car, has this gaze, he's looking into the horizon, but really looking inside, and then we see a flashback. Same stretch of road, it's night, so we don't really see what is going on which was one of the beautiful things about Eo, the way Eo used the film I saw yesterday, used the darkness of the stables where the animals are kept, where you see and you don't see. And in this darkness, there is a race because you hear the roaring of the engines. There are lights because the cars have headlights, but it's mostly dark and there is an accident. And you see that in the accident, this man, who Steve McQueen, Michael Delaney, race car driver as a character, was involved. And again, you have maybe five minutes, maybe more than five minutes, without any lines. And you're watching this, and of course, you naturally wonder, who are these two? Who's the woman? Who's the man? 
are they connected in some way? We know about the man more specifically that he had an accident during a race that happened in the same place that he is now visiting. But how does he feel about the accident? Is he, is he still traumatized? Is that an ongoing concern for him? Did he lose someone else in that accident? The accident involved two cars. Now, these gaps, these questions, are is how a film builds up a story, okay? And in terms of visualization, road movies are about the easiest films to build and to produce. Because when you think of the combination between psychology and cinema, and psychology is about a movement of transformation, right? You move through time, and thanks to sessions with your psychologist or psychiatrist, you become a new person. And cinema also has inherited that idea that the story of the film is a story of a transformation. Not true about every film, but true about a lot of film. How do you visualize this metamorphosis from the old character to the new character? The easiest way is to make it visual through a journey. The journey is not a metaphor anymore, it's a real journey. The road trip movie or the road movie is about people being on the road, going places, and when they get to that destination, which is exterior, their interior, their inner self is different, right? And everything that happens on the road will Will, will give you a glimpse of the ongoing transformation or will give you reasons for the motivation for the justification for the transformation. So for example, in the first film we will see in this class, 1934, it happened one night, Frank Capra, five Oscars including Best Picture, we have a couple of characters who don't know each other and who are moving together from Florida and New York. They're a man and a woman. They apparently hate each other. She cannot stand him. He is exploiting her because he's a journalist and she's hiding her true identity. <clears throat> she's the daughter of a millionaire. She's American aristocracy of the time, but she's escaping from the, the constrictions of her family. <clears throat> of course, I haven't talked. My voice is still weak from the break. By the end of the movie, what is the transformation? They change each other. They don't just fall in love with each other, which would be banal and not Oscar-winning material. They change each other through their forced proximity. They spend all these hours on a bus initially, then in a car, on foot. So they influence each other, they change each other, and they fall in love. And by the end, it's not just the destination New York. The destination is their new role, their new identity as lovers, okay? Or take, well, I don't know if you've seen Bones and All by Italian director Guadagnino, uh, which came out not very long ago. It's not streaming yet. <coughs> In Bones and All, you have a young woman, age 18, who realizes that growing up as an adult, she comes to the realization that she's an eater, right? The film is about these mysterious creatures that are vampires, they're not werewolves, they call themselves eaters, they eat human flesh. And she's forced to leave her house because she has 
beaten off the finger of her dear high school friend because she, she had this strong desire, this impulse. Right? She's attracted by human flesh, and so she bites off her finger one night, and then her father says, we have to leave. We have three minutes before the police will come here, and then the father himself leaves her with a tape where he tells her her story a little bit, how he discovered that she was an eater, and that he cannot do anything for her. She's on her own. She decides to look for her mother. She has a birth certificate. She knows where her mother was born, so she has to travel to this place. And of course, along the journey, she will meet other eaters. And of course, through the movie, you understand what eating stands for. That eating is a metaphor, that this journey is in fact about something else. That eating human flesh in the US in the 1980s is a metaphor for being sexually active with the same sex in that kind of society, where same sex love was discriminated, was seen as odd or as pathological, right? So there is a destination, an exterior destination. She will find her mother in a mental hospital, but that's not the real destination, right? The real destination is her growing awareness of her identity, which will come by the end of the film, okay? So this is the way you associate a physical journey with a spiritual, psychological, sometimes mystical journey. And there are other examples we can make and that I'll present to you starting on Wednesday. In recent films, the journey doesn't have to be from point A to point B, right? As in bones and all, from your house to the uh, mental hospital of the mother, but then the movie continues, or from Florida to New York State. Sometimes the journey is not linear. It can be time spent on the road that changes the character. The film Drive My Car, which won the International Feature Film Oscar last year, is a wonderful example of that. There is one journey there from Hiroshima to the island of Hokkaido in Japan, but mostly the film shows the characters on the road because this actor-director is engaged in the production of Uncle Vanya, and uh, at a cultural center in Hiroshima, and they give him a driver, a female driver, who's driving him every day from his house, which is about an hour away to the theater, and then back from the theater to the house. So it's not A and a distant B location, it's back and forth. But what happens inside the car, what happens on the road, is essential to the film itself. Because what happens in the car is theater and storytelling. So movement itself is also a common metaphor for storytelling, right? And there are a lot of stories about journeys. It is intrinsic to that. So we will examine a series of 13 films that can be classified as road movies from 1934, it happened one night, to 2022, Drive My Car. And we will not deal with all the <coughs> details and the intricacies of cinematic techniques. Of course, we will talk about camera angles a little bit. We will talk about editing we will talk about the script, which is often, in our case, based on a short story. Like, it happened one night, the short story is Night Bus, 1933. Or 
drive my car, which is based on two short stories in Men Without Women by Murakami, a collection of short stories by this Japanese writer. And uh, so we will use some of these details to have a cultural understanding of the film. Okay, so this is not a class that requires a level of expertise in cinema. You may have taken other courses in cinema studies or film studies at this university. We have both designators, or you may not. It's fine either way. And the way we'll make the work in the class manageable is that we will focus on some elements that are typical of the road movies genre, and we'll, we'll use a simple matrix that you will try to apply and adapt to the various assignments, with the basic elements that, in part, I just mentioned. One is, what is the destination in this road trip movie? Or the destinations, because there might be more than one. What is the transformation that happens along the journey? The road, what happens on the road that prompts that transformation? Or that provokes that transformation? That is to say, you may be on the verge of a change, and then something happens, and you enable that change. You enable yourself to change. Or what happens on the road can change you from the outside. And impersonation. Because part of changing yourself is experimenting with the new you. And in a road movie, often the characters will try to pretend to be what they're not. Because being in the road means being out of your familiar environment, being with strangers or mostly surrounded by people who don't know you, and that's a safe space to experiment a role that you would like to perform in life. And there is a lot of that which can be through acting, physical acting, or through the things that characters say to each other on the road. And a lot of that happens, as I said before, when we look at the first example of a road movie, the model for the genre, Frank Capra, was a pioneer, one of the founders of modern cinema. The female character is hiding her identity. And at the same time, her pretend identity is the first step into a new identity that she will fully developed by the end of the film. The, the male character is a journalist, but pretending to be someone else, and at the same time falling in love with the woman, pretending to be a certain kind of leading male character. I'm a man, I'll tell you what to do, and being redefined by her, no, you cannot tell me what to do. Okay, I'll show you, and, and the woman itself, herself will take the lead in some scenes. And finally, as I said, the, the underpinning uh, of this exercise is always, what are the questions? What are the gaps? How is the film telling you the story in a visual way? Through the mise-en-scene, that is to say the stage design, what, what you put in the frame, not only the characters, but also the other elements, right? The props, the objects, the backgrounds, the location, right? And what is that adding to the story, right? This is the understanding of cinema for us, and this is what we'll try to do through the semester. Just a little tidbit for now. Let's talk briefly, for example, about the use of the body in a film. Can you tell me what is the main difference between real life and a scene in a film in terms of the use of the body? And this is true also of other media. Very true of TV, almost always true of YouTube videos, especially successful 
YouTube videos. How is the body handled in a scene differently from real life? Yeah. Can it be like more exaggerated, maybe? Emphatic, yeah. Movement have to be more emphatic, right? Because you have to get the focus of the spectator on a gesture that might have a layer, uh, different layers of significance, right? So how do you be emphatic? How do you, how are you emphatic? Of course, I cannot speak English uh, any longer after the break, but uh, bilingual minds, okay? So what would be an example of being more emphatic? Can you think of one or anyone? It doesn't have to be you because you mentioned this, but since you did, I don't know if you had ideas on that. I don't know, maybe like facial expressions and movements maybe? Initially facial expressions a lot, right? In silent films and up until the 1930s, a lot of exaggerated facial expressions, right? Which gives this impression of naivete to a lot of silent films, right? Uh, it's like a bad mime. And this, not sound, this is what determined the conclusion, the demise of a lot of stars from the 1920s to the 1930s. It's not like, oh, they couldn't act because sound was there and all of a sudden they had to express the lines with their voice and they couldn't. Of course not, they, they were actors. Uh, this is what happens in Downton Abbey. Uh, which one, the, the first Downton Abbey? No, the, the, the last Downton Abbey. Right? Have you seen The Last Downton Abbey or is it too boomerish for you? Yeah. Okay. In The Last Downton Abbey, uh, they have a crew that films in the palace, in the mansion, right? And uh, all of a sudden, the producers decide that this has to be a movie with sound and some of the actors cannot deal with it. No, no. The issue was that actors from the 1920s were uh, used to expressing everything with their face. And this played to their advantage. They built their career on that. When they moved to sound, the emphatic use of the face was a no-no. So you had to retrain yourself not to the use of the voice. Of course, an actor can use their voice. But retrain yourself to limit your facial expressions. And that got a lot of star stuck and, and their career fizzled. Okay, but one of the ways you're emphatic is you slow down, for example, right? Think of acting in its typical environment, the stage, right? Acting is born in a theater. Now, no matter what the theater, the stage is always limited, right? So when a character moves from one place to another, that is significant, right? The way they place themselves in comparison to, in reference to the other characters, etc. But the way you materialize the significance of this movement is that you slow down a little bit, just enough, right? Like a model on a right way, right? That is not walking, right? It's not normal walking. It's runaway walking, because otherwise people would not perceive this as a show. So one way is slowing down, could be the gesture of an arm or a hand. But the most glaring, the most evident, conspicuous difference between real life and a scene is fixity, the stillness of the body. As I said, this is true of TV. When you see the journalists reading the news, their shoulder never move. Their face may move. Their forearms may move. But their torso and their shoulders remain even. This is true of the most popular YouTubers, again, with plenty of exceptions, especially in YouTube. And this is especially true of films. You don't move your body at all unless the character has to do that to express meaning. But otherwise, you don't do what you do in normal life. In normal life, you're moving all the time. Right? You're sitting at a table and talking. You're sitting next to someone and talking. 
you move constantly. Small movements, not in a movie scene. And it's one of those things that you may not notice at all because that's the vehicle for the act of film. But once you pay attention to it, you see it. Once you know about it, then you see it. It doesn't matter what the genre of the movie is, unless the character has to run, right? But when characters are just talking and communicating to each other, they'll move their face, they might move their hands and forearms, but their torso, their shoulders remain as even as possible because otherwise it would be distracting. Otherwise, it would take away from the actual focus, which has to be the mouth, the eyes, the face, the conversation itself. So that's the difficulty of acting for a film. Not simply memorizing lines or expressing those lines, but selectively blocking your body. Learning how to still whatever muscle limb in your body is not part of the scene and just using whatever is part of the scene. Is it the voice? Is it the face as well? Is it the eyes? Is it the hands? And you just move those, but you don't move anything else because otherwise uh, it might seem more lifelike, but it's not cinema. It doesn't work on the screen, right? Same with editing. What's the simplest way to understand editing? Even if you're not a cinema studies major or minor. Well, think of the poor quality videos you shoot with your phone. What is the problem with that? What is the problem with people shooting a video with their phone? People will take the phone and will move around, right? They will not stay in the same shot unless it's a shot of someone talking, you say, oh, take a shot of me, take a selfie. But otherwise, you move the phone, right? And that is not how real life comes onto the screen. The effect is not there. And you wonder, but when I go to the movies, I have this sense of movement. I have this sense of a place and the various angles. But this is all done with editing, not by moving the camera. And again, there are plenty of exceptions. There are great cinematographers, great directors who will have a sequence of 10 minutes, of 15 minutes, unheld, without editing at all. But those are the exceptions because they're almost impossible to produce. Otherwise, it is fixed camera angle, something happens. Let's take EO that I saw yesterday. A shot of a polished town, the shot is framed by the buildings, I see buildings on one side, on the other side I see a series of windows going through the frame, almost up to the center of the frame. I see this road, but the road is going down and nothing is happening. On, I, I don't see passers-by, I don't see people at the windows. Then I see someone at the window. It's a woman and, and she, she has a tablecloth or a bed linen and she's scrolling the dust, right? She, she's shaking the dust off of that. And she has this forward motion from here through the center. So my attention is directed to the center again. And then from the bottom of the street, since the street is coming up towards me, I see the hats and the heads of people. And then I see this group, which is a group of supporters and players of a local soccer team and the protagonist, who is a donkey, coming into the shot. So there is movement, but the frame is still all the time while they're coming into that. And then to create the sensation of life, which is movement, you change the camera angle and you stitch it together with the other. You don't move the camera. You do very little of this in film because it rarely works. It might work with some stories, but it rarely works otherwise. And that's why it is dangerous. You think, I have a phone, I have this camera, which is 50 megapixels and 31% better than last year's camera, and I'll shoot wonderful videos. No, it's always the same crappy videos because your grandmother could do that. 
no offense to your grandmother, <laughs> right? And, and you do that, which is the opposite of what is done in films, okay? So this is about everything that I had, and it's 11.20. As I said, and for anyone who might have come a few minutes late, the class is not on Blackboard. It's not on Brightspace. It's on Notion, and the easiest way to get there is put in andreafelit.com, ccs3, slash ccs381 on your browser. At the same time, if as of 8 a.m. this morning, you were registered in the class, look at your inbox, and there is a message from me with the link, also my email, how to reach out to me before Wednesday, if you need to. On Wednesday of this week, I'll put the website on the screen, go over the syllabus, discuss the major assignments, answer any questions, and then I'll spend a little bit knowing you. What are you doing here at this university? What is your journey? What are you going to do afterwards? What is your favorite movie? Better yet, if you want to think about this before now, between now and Wednesday, not so much what is your favorite movie, which is boring. What is your favorite movie moment? A scene in a movie you like, which for you is the essence of cinema because it moved you or surprised you or astonished you in one way or the other. On the website you find assignments, but the first assignment is due Friday of next week, so there are no assignments immediately other than go look at the syllabus. Skip a few standard sections that read the description of the topic of the class and look at the uh, various components of the final grade. 